Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the June meeting um, of the Southeast chapter of SCCM uh, here in Atlanta, as well as across our seven states and all our remote sites. Um, as a reminder, the CE for a deadline for this meeting will be June 25th. And you should have received a slide for all uh, the CE with instructions on how to submit. As always, we always start with the chapter's mission and vision. Uh, the chapter's mission is to emulate the SCCM mission, uh, which is to secure the highest quality of care for all critically ill and injured patients in the Southeast region by providing educational as well as research opportunities and promoting multi-professional collaboration. Our vision is that all critically ill and injured persons in the Southeast uh, region will receive care from a present integrated team of dedicated trained intensivists and critical care specialists, as well as inspired new leaders and providers in critical care in the region. Uh, we'll start with a few announcements before I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank everyone who's participated in the National Critical Care Awareness and uh, Recognition Month. Um, this past May, we loved seeing all the pictures that came through of everyone enjoying the treats that we're able to provide through the chapter. Thank you for all your hard work that you do every day on your units. As part of our celebration, we are pleased to congratulate Leslie Kirk, uh, Kirkendale, um, one of the nurses, a critical care nurse out of Memphis um, Baptist in Memphis, uh, for receiving the 2019 Barbara A. McLean Contributions to Critical Care Nursing Award uh, for her um, significant contributions to the field of neurocritical care. You can read more about her wonderful achievements in our newsletter or on our website. Uh, we'd like to remind everyone that Spike Out Sepsis will be happening this year. We're actively planning for our next event. Um, the date will be announced once confirmed, but it, it is going to happen in the fall. Please keep an eye on our website as well as our social media for a, the specific date that will be announced soon. We're also looking for volunteers um, for this event, and you do not have to be in Atlanta to help out. You can certainly help. There's quite a bit of work that can be done remotely as well, so you can contribute to this amazing event by helping raise funds uh, for Spike Out Sepsis and Sepsis Alliance um, if you volunteer. Please check out our website and feel free to reach out to any of the leadership of the um, chapter if you'd like to volunteer. We'd also like to announce our mentor-mentee program um, that we've started. It is meant as a multi-professional mentor-mentee program for all chapter members. Um, this is a great way to make professional connections and get great advice as a mentee or give back as a mentor. You can sign up on our website for this program. Additionally, we'd like to announce our new bite-sized lectures. Um, this is another way for chapter members to get involved and um, have a regional platform to present. Um, each one hour lecture will be split into three to four speakers for each giving 15 to 20 minute talks. And if you're interested, you can also email the chapter to find out more information. Um, you can also check the website for uh, more information on that. Finally, we'd like to remind you to mark your calendars for our next meeting, which will be on August 13th. Um, this meeting will be live in Birmingham, um, and our speaker, our guest speaker, will be the SCCM's immediate past president, Dr. Jerry uh, Zimmerman, who will be speaking to us on fostering the learning healthcare environment in the PICU. Without further ado, I'd like to um, present our speaker today. Um, Dr. Andre Holder will be speaking to us tonight. Um, Dr. Holder is a clinician scientist with multiple specialty backgrounds, including emergency medicine, internal medicine, and critical care medicine. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine at Emory University. Through collaborations with um, colleagues in the Department of Biomedical Informatics, his primary area of research focus is the successful clinical deployment of advanced data-driven um, algorithms to predict clinical decompensation of patients. His career goals include uh, determining appropriate timing and use of interventions to prevent or mitigate syndromes of critical illness by forecasting the evolution of the patient's decompensation and organ failure, advancing the understanding of sepsis pathophysiology through innovative data science techniques, and identifying novel dynamic physiologic biomarkers in sepsis. 
Other areas of uh, research interest include early sepsis resuscitation, um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and hemodynamic monitoring. He attends in the MICU at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta, as well as in a mixed medical surgical ICU at Emory Midtown um, Hospital in Atlanta as well. Without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Andre Holder to the stage. So thank you very much, Rita. Appreciate it. Um, so before I begin, I just want to start by saying you may find it odd that the sepsis guy is talking about respiratory failure. Um, well, let's just say that I'm an intensivist first. Uh, and, you know, my experience with non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation is through that experience. Um, I should also preface my talk by saying that I am not a pulmonologist, um, contrary to what my, uh, my division might tell you. Uh, so I purely practice in the ICU. So all of my exposure to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, at least professionally, is, um, is through my experiences in the ICU, and that's going to be the focus of this talk. So um, the one financial disclosure I have really has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, and that's my support for my, um, my sepsis work. So the learning objectives today are to first understand the pathophysiolo pathophysiologic effects of non-invasive positive pressure, pressure ventilation. Um, we'll learn the indications uh, for it uh, based on the evidence. And then also to become familiar with the traditional ways that we think about NIV and also the newer ways um, uh, and their respective indications. So um, we're gonna talk, so my outline really just goes over what I call the what, why, how, and whens. Of, of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So first off, what is it? Uh, what are the types of traditional modes uh, and interfaces that we have? Why should it be used? And much of that actually has to do with the physiologic effects. Um, how is it currently used in the wild, if you will? So untamed, unchartered territory that's not studied, you're not, not your average randomized controlled trial patient. Um, and um, on the flip side, when should it really be used based on the evidence that we have? A little extra bonus stuff that I'm going to talk about, again, has to do with some of these newer methods of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And then I'll summarize and we'll have some time for questions, hopefully. So first off, what is it? Um, well, it is a essentially a ventilatory setting that gives you mechanically assisted breaths without having plastic in your throat or surgical airway. Sort of the best way to think about it. So you essentially are in control of your own breathing with some support. The modes of de delivery that we have are um, so continuous positive airway pressure and bi-level positive airway pressure, or what's commonly referred to as BiPAP. And we'll talk about how that's different in a minute. And um, so besides the mode, it's also important to know what the interface is. And this actually has to do with some of the things um, some of the, the newer ways and some of the more traditional ways that, that we tend to think about NIV, and that's a little bit of a teaser for later on. So the nasal or full mask is what most of us are used to when we work in the ICU, um, but there's also newer technologies, so things like high flow, um, uh, nasal cannula, and also helmet ventilation, which I'll try to touch on a bit at the end. So the traditional methods, um, I just wanted to spell some not necessarily to spell some mis misunderstandings, but really just try to shed some light on some sil similarities between the terms that we use, depending on the type of ventilation that patients have or the way that they're getting ventilated. So um, CPAP is what you generally hear used <laughs> in reference to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, but essentially all that means is that you have positive pressure at expiration, right? So this is, by the way, the same thing as um, EPAP or expiration, uh, expiratory positive airway pressure that you would hear in BiPAP settings, and also the same as PEEP if someone's mechanically ventilated and is intubated or has a trach. So, um, and then, you know, with BiPAP, the things that you want to hear about is what, what the EPAP is, which is what I just mentioned, uh, and also the IPAP. So this is what differentiates it from CPAP. In other words, you have assistance, if you will, that's, uh, that's over and above the level of pressure that you're getting 
with expiration. So that's what's called the IPAP or inspiratory positive airway pressure. So this is similar uh, in patients who are intubated on vents to pressure support. Now, uh, for those of you who are also familiar with uh, uh, the trigger target cycle um, that we talk about in patients who are ventilated. So the same is true, by the way, of mechanical ventilation with, uh, BiPAP or, with BiPAP, again, because it's a mechanical mode of ventilation. So it's either patient or time triggered. In other words, the patient generates the breath or the machine will for them. It's pressure targeted. In other words, once you get to that IPAP pressure, it's, it doesn't go above that pressure. And then the cycle or what terminates the inspiration cycle is the flow. So usually it's below a certain maximum inspiratory flow that you had during inspiration. Usually it's about 25%. Um, that's when it'll stop giving you that positive, that extra pressure support or IPAP. So some of the more traditional non-invasive interfaces that we have is the oral mask or the full face mask, which probably most of us are familiar with seeing in the ICU. And then there's also the nasal mask. So the nasal masks are great. Um, so they're generally more comfortable. There's less risk of aspiration. Uh, there's less dead space. In other words, there's less stuff that's sitting in between the vent and the patient um, that's allowing for better ventilation. But the disadvantage is that the biggest disadvantage and the reason that we don't use it in the ICU very often is because you have air leaks. So um, usually, uh, just show of hands, how many people actually work in the ICU? Just so I get an idea of my audience here. Okay, so great. Now, um, of the patients that you have seen in the ICU when you've applied BiPAP to them or CPAP, um, how many of them were tachypneic? None? Really? That's shocking. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. How many people had um, higher work of breathing? That's usually the reason that we're giving, right? And because of that, there are, when, when patients are in distress, they mouth breathe. So if you're mouth breathing, you lose that seal, if you will, that you would have uh, between the machine, the mask, and the patient's lungs. So that's the reason that it's generally not used, because we use it in patients who are in distress. And if patients are in distress, generally they're mouth breathing. Now, what about the oral facial mask? So again, you have that complete seal around the mouth. So that's one of the biggest advantages. So even in patients who are in respiratory distress, you'll have minimal air leak, right? Um, it's also more efficacious in patients who have hypercapnia because you have decreased dyspnea and improved gas exchange. Now, the disadvantages are all the advantages that you saw with nasal CPAP, right? Or with nasal masks. So um, there's higher risk of aspiration because there's stuff that's forced down their airway, regardless of whether or not um, they're ready for it. Uh, and if they're on it longer, higher the risk, right? There's also risk of skin breakdown as well, which you tend to actually see more in, with that than the nasal mask. And it's probably because of the indication that we use it. Um, and then there's this little guy here, again, just a little bit of a teaser. teaser. I just wanted to show you what this thing looks like. It's almost like a space suit, right? Um, but that's actually a legitimate mode of ventilation that's actually getting a lot of buzz more recently in the literature, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, why do we use NIPV in, NIPPV in the acute care setting? So um, just throw out some, some reasons. Well, try to avoid innovation is the ultimate reason, right? But what's, what is, what's usually the thing that's triggering us to say, hmm, maybe that person needs to get um, some BiPAP or, or CPAP? Big stuff, right? So you're talking, you're giving me diagnoses, but what are you seeing in front of you? Say it again. Poor oxygenation. All right, that's one. What else? Hypercapnia. That's another one. What's another one? The last one, which again, if you look in the room, what's the patient looking like? Right. So if they're having difficulty breathing, if there's increased work of breathing, right? So those are your three indications right there, at least in the acute setting, right? So the reason that we use it, as was mentioned earlier, is because we want to avoid sticking plastic into their throat, right? We don't want to intubate them and put them on mechanical ventilation that way. And there's reasons for that, right? So, um, so mechanical ventilation through, uh, through the ET tube can cause complications. So it can cause cord paralysis. It can cause VAEs or VAPs. So, um, and the, the reason also that we do this is for patient comfort, right? So it's not very nice having 
um, an ET tube sitting in your airway and going down your glottis, right? Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, Mother Nature made us such that we have our own ways of protecting our ventilate, protecting our airway, right? So it's our bulbar, mu bulbar muscles, so all the upper pharyngeal muscles, and our ability to cough. So by putting an ET tube into the person's airway, you're mitigating all of those things because ultimately the patient's going to get sedated, which is, which is going to depress their cough, right? So again, all the things that we're trying to avoid by, uh, by giving people non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as opposed to invasive. And then um, there may be more favorable, favorable outcomes. So this is sort of a spoiler alert. Um, it depends on the circumstance. And that's sort of what I want to bring home here is that you don't want to use this in everyone um, because it may not be indicated in everyone. Now, here's a bit of the fun part. So I'm a bit of a physiology nerd. So um, obviously, most of the reason that we're doing non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is because we want to do something with the lungs, right, for all the indications that we just talked about. So first off, it improves gas exchange, right? So if you're Particularly with BiPAP, if you're forcing air down their throat during ins inspiration, you're going to drive more CO2 out on exhalation. So, right, so that makes sense. Um, you're increasing the patient's mean airway pressure. So, um, what's the way that patients who are intubated and on mechanical ventilation that way improve oxygenation? So, it's either through FiO2 or through PEEP, right? Now, why is it that PEEP improves oxygenation? So it's because most of our time is spent in exhalation. You're breathing normally and you're not pretty tachypnic. So the reason actually is not because of the PEEP, it's because the PEEP is increasing their mean airway pressure because you're spending more time in that setting, right? In that, in that, uh, in that exhaled state. So the other thing that we do, that we use it for is because it improves um, respiratory muscle fatigue, right? So it helps to improve that. Um, so these are, again, all the indications that we just said that we actually place patients on BiPAP, right? So improved CO2 clearance, improved oxygenation, decreased work of breathing, right? Now, um, the interesting thing about NIPVB, though, is it, just, it doesn't just affect the lungs. So it also affects the heart. And this is actually where it gets interesting. So number one is that it decreases preload. Um, and this, so the other thing that we see is that it, it may or may not improve contractility, but it also decreases afterward. So um, let's take the contractility piece out of the equation. Let's just assume that we're saying it increases. So what would all of those things be helpful for? Anyone? Heart failure, Heart failure right? So besides its improved oxygenation in patients who have heart failure, these are the reasons why it also helps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So why does NIPPB decrease preload? Um, I want you to focus on this side of the slide for me. So if you have really high intrathoracic pressure, which is what you're doing with NIPPB or mechanical ventilation, um, what happens is that you actually decrease venous return, as evidenced by this little, this little arrow here. When you decrease venous return, what happens to the left heart? The left heart also has decreased venous return. So that's why you decrease preload. It's very simple. Now, uh, I said earlier that there are variable effects on cardiac function, and this actually depends on a couple factors. So number one is it depends on what your peripheral vascular resistance is, sorry, your, your pulmonary vascular resistance. So um, that's illustrated over on this figure here, right? So in the top slide, you'll see here that there's increased PBR. Now, what that does is essentially what we just talked about before. So what it does is actually, so it doesn't increase, it doesn't decrease RV preload, it actually increases RV preload because you're increasing afterload. So this is the afterload, this is part of the afterload on the right heart. So when you're doing that, what happens with the left heart? So if less blood is coming out from the right heart, as is evidenced by this larger right heart here. What's gonna happen is you're actually decreasing preload on the left heart. Right. Um, so again, this isn't someone who, say, has is on really high PEEP or on really high EPAP, or in or has history of COPD, or they're really hypoxic, and because of that, they're having hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So all of those things will actually um, increase your PVR, which will have that effect on your cardiac output. 
Now, this also depends though on your baseline cardiac function. So if your heart is pumping, if your heart is normal under these circumstances, um, your heart may actually just get really efficient at pumping things out because there's also decreased after load and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Um, but if your heart, if particularly your left heart is not functioning properly, if you, um, even if you have a decrease in, in, in your pulmonary vascular resistance for whatever reason, um, you gave them uh, epoprostanol, right? Even if that occurs, the problem is, is that what you're also what you're going to do with that is you're going to increase their preload. And if you increase their preload, then you're um, in a weak heart. Your weak heart is not going to be able to pump it as effectively. So the way to think about how it affects contractility is just two ways. So what it does to the pulmonary vascular resistance, and again, by by virtue of that, what it does to RV afterload, and then also what it does to baseline cardiac function, or what the baseline cardiac function is. Excuse me. Now. Decreased afterload is actually an interesting, an interesting um, process. Now, the way to think, I just want to bring up three points here. So the way to think about this is uh, if you lay, if you have a balloon and you have it filled with water and you lay it to the side, of course, because of gravity, all the water is going to eventually flow out, but it'll take time, right? Now, instead of that, repeat that experiment. And this time, instead of just letting it fall out, smash the balloon. So what's going to happen to the water? How is it going to go? Is it going to go out faster or slower? Right, faster, right? So um, the analogy there is the gravity is the normal cardiac output, right? Um, what you're doing in uh, increasing intrathoracic pressure is by giving them positive pressure ventilation is you're smashing the, the balloon or the left heart in that particular case, right? So um, the way to think about afterload is it's the pressure or the 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 amount of of pressure that the heart has to has to build up in order to overcome um, any resistance to contracting. All right, so so it increases after it increases afterload because in theory at least that balloon is doing less to get the water out or gravity is doing less to get the the, the water out because you're actually doing more of the work for it. So you're decreasing what's called the stroke work of the heart by doing that. Now, that's illustrated here in these slides. So this, if you're familiar, these are pressure volume. These are analogous to pressure volume flow loops where um, on the bottom here is diastole. So this is the beginning of diastole. This is the end of diastole. This is when the heart contracts. And this is where your, your, um, your aortic valve opens. So you actually get rid of all that, that volume, and then the heart relaxes, and you're back at, at the beginning of, of diastole again, all right? So the thing that I want to illustrate here are two things. So number one, you'll notice that as you increase PEEP, um, to reinforce the point that I, I was bring, points that I was bringing up earlier, as you're increasing PEEP, what's happening to your stroke volume, which is that the length of this line right here? So as you're increasing peak, so these are the, the ones with higher peak, these are the ones with lower peak. Anyone see that? So you're decreasing, you're actually decreasing your stroke volume um, by increasing peak, all right? Now, more importantly, and this is what I wanna focus on for this slide, what's happening though as you're increasing peak? So particularly to the height here, right? So again, this is, analogous to the, the left ventricular volume, this is analogous to left ventricular pressure. What's happening to the height here as you're increasing P? It's going down, right? So what this height is, is your afterload. So this is the amount of pressure that your LV has to generate in order to overcome that force that's resisting it to contract. So again, take home point here is that as you increase your uh, your intrathoracic pressure, you're actually gonna decrease your afterload. Now, the other thing I wanna mention here, and the difference between this slide, this side of the slide, and this side of the slide, is your notice that your LV and diastolic pressure here is five, and over here it's 12. So this is analogous to someone who may be normal volemic or maybe even a little hypovolemic. Um, and this is analogous to someone who just got a volume load. So what I want you to focus on is the height here. 
and the difference between the height at higher peaks with more volume oops, versus the height at um, higher peaks with less volume. So what happens to the, um, what happens here? So you'll notice that your afterload actually stays relatively high. It still goes down, but it goes down less. Now this is actually someone who may be a little hypervolemic. So in other words, their heart is a little too stretched. And because of that, even with the assistance of positive pressure, you're still not able to decrease the afterload sufficiently to decrease the, the, uh, the height of this curve. So the take home point here again is that you're when you add, give someone intrathoracic pressure, you're decreasing their afterload. Now, obese patients, um, we use this fairly commonly in obese patients. Uh, one study that had about 70 something patients or so uh, showed that obese patients needed higher settings um, and more time for recovery, all right? So, and these are patients who were, who were given non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, usually for obstructive sleep apnea, for hi acute hypercapnic respiratory failure secondary to that. So you'll notice here that the IPAP and EPAP settings, 18 over 7. So that's, fair, that's a lot, right? Now, despite that, the obese group, um, who, by the way, I should mention, actually also had more acute pulmonary cardio, uh, cardiopulmonary edema compared to the non-obese group, which had generally more pneumonia as the reason for why they were hypercaptic and why they needed BiPAP. But looking at the obese group compared to the non-obese group, so even though the obese group had more patients who had pulmonary edema as their indication, um, almost actually twice that much, their intubation and mortality rates were the same. Now that's, that's probably hinting at something. Um, so it probably means that these patients, if they died the same rate, even though they were intubated at the same rate, they were probably sicker and they probably needed to be intubated anyway. Now, um, so the take home point here is that you might need to give your, your obese patients, you will need to give your obese patients higher settings if you're starting them on, on BiPAP, but also um, uh, they may also just need more time to actually see some signs of recovery. So um, how many of you guys, so what, give me some, some indications of when you use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So those of you who work in the ICU, when do you use it? And here I'm talking about diagnoses now. Okay. <laughs> Say it again. Asthma exacerbation. Asthma exacerbation. Okay. Any others? Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, all comers or specific patients or, or specific patients with specific histories or? <laughs> Fair enough. So um, anyone, so I heard COPD, I heard heart failure, um, I heard post-extubation. Um, anyone use it for sleep apnea? Okay, so we're not too far off from what most people are doing. So you'll notice here that many people actually, the most of the times that it's used initially, so about 93%, um, were for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. And then of course, followed by pulmonary edema and oh, for some reason that didn't come out. Yeah, for COPD as well. So notice the failure rates here when they started it for those patients. So it's actually lower in the patients with obstructive sleep apnea, but um, we'll talk later about when, you know, there's proven mortality benefit with using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So you may ask yourself, what's the downside of using this, right? So if I can prevent patients from getting intubated, then why not try it? Well, there are some downsides. So, um, and this is, this is, there's not the strongest evidence for that, but there's suggestion that the longer you wait um, is probably the worst they'll get. And that's probably a good thing, right? So. Um, a good thing to think about and probably a good approach to have. So this one study that came out uh, back in 04 by Esteban in New England Journal had about 200 patients and these patients, they were actually randomized to 
um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or not. Um, and this was in, and the indication was for post extubation failure. So the things that we were just talking about. So um, again, a very specific use, but the, so notice that there was a similar reintubation rate, but also a higher death rate. So that's a little strange, right? Um, now, one reason possibly for that is that in the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation group, um, those patients were intubated on average about twice as twice or they took about twice as long to get intubated, I should say, um, compared to those who were in the um, who in the other group. So again, suggesting maybe there's an association between the length of time that patients are on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and um, mortality. So, I mean, this sort of makes sense, right? I mean, if, if, if you're on the Titanic and you already got hit by the iceberg, what's the sense in grabbing a bucket and trying to get the water out? Why don't you just get the lifeboat and just leave, right? So, I mean, in other words, you, should, you shouldn't just, you shouldn't go along with the sinking ship. You shouldn't just keep increasing the, the, the vent settings for an IPPV if it's pretty obvious that the patient is not gonna do well. So a couple of the other downsides, um, besides that possible association between length of time for prolonged intubation, intubation with an IPPV and death um, is aspiration. So again, as we talked about with those full masks, which is what, what we tend to use most, and then also hemodynamic instability. Um, again, this is more, more much higher pressure settings. So um, a little while back, again, almost about 15, about 15 years ago, um, Frat and Critical Care Medicine actually looked at what are the factors associated with risk of NIP, NIPBV failure in patients who were given this for acute hypoxic respiratory failure. And keep in mind, this is all patients who are on masks, right? So at this time, high flow was not really in vogue. So um, the thing I wanna focus on is right at the bottom. So obviously it makes sense that the people who fail are the people who are sicker, right? So if they have a high, a lower P to F ratio, um, then it's probably more likely that they'll fail. But notice this. So the higher tidal volumes, why would that be? So the, the supposition here and what they wrote in their discussion is that there's concern perhaps that these patients who are on an IPPV and they're generating really high tidal volumes, that might be causing, um, quote, if you will, ventilator-induced lung injury. Um, that might be contributing more to their hypoxia. So that's sort of the, the suggestion that they got from this. So let's go back to the best indications. So this will be easy, right? We'll breeze through these. So oh, you might've seen one of those already. Um, so you saw, of course, COPD, um, and that's actually the one with the best evidence. Um, what's another one? Any other indications? So by diagnosis, I'm talking about. So heart failure, right? Yeah. So um, the evidence is not as strong. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, also really good. Uh, that's it, guys. <laughs> all right, so all the other things that we talk about using it for, um, there's, again, suggestion that there might be benefit, um, but we'll sort of go through some of the weeds in a little bit. So. Um, again, NIPBV decreases mortality in patients with COPD. So in this meta-analysis here um, that came from Cochrane, sorry about that, uh, we saw a 46% decrease in mortality um, with use of NIPBV as opposed to um, not, or just supplemental oxygen. So that translates to essentially a number needed to treat of 12. So if you have 12 people who uh, you do this to, one of them will actually have mortality. Um, it also decreases the need for innovation, as you might imagine. Um, and the effect here was actually even greater. So uh, what is that, a 64% decrease in, 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 um, in rate of intubation for those who, have an I, who were given an IPDB versus uh, those who were not. It also decreases hospital length of stay, right? So by um, a little under three and a half days. Makes sense, right? So patients who are not intubated, 
they'll probably stay less in, uh, le for, for a lesser time in the ICU or in the hospital than patients who were not, who were, who were not, who were, excuse me. So uh, NIPPV uh, also switching gears now to heart failure. So NIPPV actually improves patient discomfort. This was shown by a uh, study uh, back in 2008 in the New England Journal, um, probably one of the larger studies looking at heart failure and indication for NIPPV. Um, so better patient, patient comfort. You might ask, well, what about the stuff that we really care about, like mortality and length of stay and things of that nature? So this study actually did not find a difference. Um, now, there's probably a lot of factors that are contributing to that. So um, first, the mortality uh, and also the intubation rate was relatively low. So in the control group, the mortality was about 15%. Um, so there, but not a whole lot. Uh, and then the intubation rate was even lower, it was 9%. So, you know, when you have uh, um, rates of things that your outcomes of interest that are that low, um, or perhaps if your therapy isn't going to provide you that um, benefit that will overcome that low mortality or low intubation rate, um, that might be the reason why. There was also a lot of crossover in the groups, by the way. So there are about 15% of patients who were in the control arm actually ended up getting an IPPV. So a lot of reasons for that. And uh, again, this just shows that here. Uh, don't be fooled by the slide, so just notice the scale. So 80 to 100 percent. So that's really a difference of about one percent in mortality. So, um, however, when this was looked at in meta-analyses, it actually does decrease mortality and intubation rates. Um, when you take, you know, the sort of tot sum total of all the studies that are out there looking at these particular uh, indications and at these particular outcomes. So this is the reason, by the way, why. It's um, why it actually, we, you know, the, the current um, mantra is that it actually does cause, it does actually improve mortality and, and uh, intubation rates based on the larger conglomerate of data that we have. So what about, uh, so what about, this question comes up, what about CPAP versus NIPPV? Um, many people argue that, you know, the, de the increased work of breathing, the, um, you know, all the, the preload effects, the afterload effects, the contractility effects that we might see with this, you can get that with just CPAP. You don't need an IPPV for that. So, uh, and in fact, this has actually been proven in the, in the EMS setting. So, uh, and this is purely in CPAP now compared to just a supplemental oxygen. There was less intubation rates, almost 70% decrease, and also lower mortality. And, um, now, when this has been, when NIPPV has been compared to CPAP, there actually has been no difference in mortality, rate of intubation, or MI. Um, there was suggestion by one paper that came out about 10 years ago that maybe there might be a mortality benefit with CPAP, but that hasn't been shown when we look at the larger data. So as far as we're concerned, CPAP and NIPPV are probably the same, which is probably why you see most people reaching for NIPPV, um, because you know patients may actually feel better with the pressure support, um, or the IPAP, I should say, to improve their work of breathing. Now, some of the other indications that we're going to talk about, so pneumonia versus an ARDS and hematologic malignancies. Um, so OSA and OHAs is, again, a big one, as you saw, based on how it's used in current practice. Asthma, I heard that mentioned earlier. Neuromuscular weakness. Um, some of these you may not even heard about. So chest wall trauma. I certainly didn't hear about this before I actually looked at the literature. Um, so the pre-hospital setting we touched on, post-extubation, which was brought up earlier, weaning patients off uh, mechanical ventilation. So in other words, prophylaxis, if you will, prophylactic NIPPV. So there may be a benefit to patients who um, have ARDS or acute lung injury with hematologic malignancies when you give them NIPPV. So um, the intubation rate in, um, uh, with hematologic malignancies was actually associated with, a, with poor survival, um, even after you control for severity of illness. Uh, and that's over twice as much um, mortality with patients who were intubated. So this is really the reason why there's been a lot of push. So maybe we can try to forego that and perhaps we can improve that mortality. So based on meta-analysis that was done, um, it actually did show better short-term mortality. Um, and I sort of highlight short-term mortality 
uh, and also lower intubation rates and shorter ICU length of stay. So again, there might be um, something there, even if it's just short-term mort mortality. If you're able to keep them in the ICU for less of time, then perhaps there might be something there to that. Now, not all immunosuppressed patients are created equal, right? So uh, notice that I highlighted hemologic malignancies earlier. And the reason for that is when we look at patients who were given an IPPV um, who had drug-related immunosuppression, so for instance, chemotherapy is the most common. We're talking about patients who receive chemotherapy for solid tumors, right? Because they're not hemologic malignancies. Um, so there was no mortality benefit there. Um, by the way, anyone can take a gander at why there might be a higher mortality rate for patients who were uh, who have hematologic malignancies. So there's a lot of theory about that. Perhaps it's you know the you know causing further ventilator induced lung injury in patients who are intubated. Maybe not because again, as we showed before, there may be some signs of ventilator induced lung injury in patients who are given an IPPV. Um, if you're giving them high tidal volumes. There's a lot of supposition. It's not really clear why at this point. So some low quality evidence um, is available out there. And I stress low quality evidence uh, for better outcomes within IPPV in morbidly obese or OHS patients. I say low quality because um, generally the studies have been much smaller and they're less effective. So um, one of the things that we do know though, based on uh, these studies, is that patients who are um, obese and have OH, OHS or OSA, and that's the indication, as I mentioned earlier, they actually may need just more time to, uh, to show improvement and also higher settings. So again, as we talked about with that other study with the IPAP and EPAP settings of 18 over seven, not usually the things that we start people on who don't have you know, OHS or, or OSA. Um, so there were also of note, more improvements when patients who had diuresis in the ICU. And a lot of that just may have to do with the, the uh, effects on preload that we were talking about before. And many of those patients actually already had right, right side heart failure. Uh, so it's, there was possibly some, some um, a higher incidence of patients who were on respiratory depressants in the OSA OHS group, who knows, in one particular study that came out. Uh, we do know the failure rate is, relatively low, so about 17%. Um, but it's also important to know morbidly obese patients, again, are all not created equal. So it also depends on what you're using it for. In there. If, they, if it's just for OHS or OS, uh, OSA, perhaps, again, it might be worthwhile to try it, again, being a bit more aggressive with the settings and giving them a little more, a little longer to, to clear themselves. But Patients are more likely to fail if the indications are um, from pneumonia or some unknown cause. Um, so other things were if they had higher severity scores, um, obviously if they're sicker, if they have more organ failure. Um, also, again, intuitively this makes sense if their PCO2s were higher. So in other words, you need to blow off more, um, more CO2, and also if their bicarbs were lower. So if there was some concomitant metabolic acidosis that <clears throat> was also contributing to that. Obviously, again, that makes sense that it's multifactorial. You probably should just go ahead and use it. So there is some, again, very low quality evidence that um, of NIPPV in patients who are mechanically um, or at risk for mechanical ventilation and asthma. So it may actually improve your FEV1, which again is your forced respiratory volume, um, sort of the marker of of badness, if you will, with patients with asthma, again, how obstructed they are. Um, so that's a surrogate marker, right? But it also may improve ICU uh, length of stay and also hospital length of stay. But notice that these effects are short term, right? So you're talking about over 40 some odd hours and again, over maybe 70 some odd hours, after which point, so the longer your patients stay in the hospital, it's probably the less of an effect you're going to see with NIPD. It's sort of the take-home point there. So one recent systematic review um, actually could not provide a recommendation or say that we shouldn't use it. it. Just basically leaves it up to us. So again, weak evidence of improved outcomes using NIPD and neuromuscular weakness. Um, 
So very, very small, single retrospective study, not even an RCT. It showed there might be decreased length of stay um, and ventilation duration uh, on NIPBD. Um, so that's really all I'd say about that. Essentially use it at your own risk, I guess, if you will, um, keeping in mind that those principles of, again, don't, don't stay in the sinking ship. If the patients look like they're not doing well, then if you you've tried an IPPV, then you should probably try something else if they look like they're getting worse. So one independent predictor, by the way, of NIPPV failure, and again, this makes sense, is how high their PCO2 is at baseline. So if it's higher than 45, and keep in mind, most of these patients do not have some hypercapnic respiratory, chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, so above that really is a, is a distress sign. Um, what I actually, so this study didn't look at pH for some odd reason, um, but that's actually really more my indication of, of, of how far off they are. But again, PCO2, higher PCO2, probably not a good, a good sign that they're gonna do well, in which case you should probably try something else at the outset. Um, so there's an argument about whether or not we should do it intermittently versus continuous. Um, your guess is as good as mine about what's the better, the better, uh, the better approach. So chest wall trauma, I'm gonna to try to blaze through some of these quickly. Um, definitely an improvement in mortality that we see here. And um, again, this might have more to do with the fact that we're not putting patients on the ventilator. Um, they're already at relatively high risk for developing ARDS because of their injury, um, and you're not exacerbating that. <clears throat> um, there are also multiple other things that are improved. So complications, things like infections, um, uh, intubation rates, length of stay, so again, chest wall trauma seems pretty good. Some of the other stuff, maybe. Neuromuscular weakness, maybe. So what about, uh, we're gonna switch gears here and talk about different settings now. So what about uh, an EMS? We actually alluded to some of this earlier, but there is actually decreased intubation and hospital mortality um, with patients who had severe respiratory distress. This was based on one particular study that came out of Annals of Emergency Medicine a few years back. Um, and these patients actually were included only if they had three things, either four things, excuse me. They had acute pulmonary edema, COPD, acute asthma, or pneumonia. So they actually included a pretty broad range of people. Um, <clears throat> now, I should mention, though, that um, more patients actually had acute pulmonary edema than anything else. So it's a little bit biased in that direction, which is probably why we still saw the hospital the inpatient um, mortality and, and uh, uh, benefit and also the decreased rate of intubation. So post-extubation. So this is, again, something that comes up. Now, uh, one, so there have been a few studies that have demonstrated, spoiler alert, improved mortality, mainly in patients with COPD. So that's really the take home here. Um, and that kind of is akin to the general trend in the literature that we're seeing where the best evidence is in patients who have COPD. Um, however, uh, there was actually improved reintubation rates when it was used prophylactically. So in other words, patients had absolutely no signs of respiratory failure after they were extubated, but they decided to put them on it anyway um, to try to prevent them from getting intubated. And this, again, was better seen in patients who had COPD. <clears throat> there was also improved mortality and length of stay uh, if they already had failure based on a study by uh, Lynn and Hart and Long. So a few other studies in various settings for post-extubation, patients with upper abdominal surgery, again, might decrease the, re the reintubation rates based on a couple of small studies. Um, Post-CT surgery, vent weaning or support. So it was found to be safe. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, it was found to be safe and actually may improve um, intubation rates in that setting as well. Reintubation rates, I should say. Um, it reduced the rates of reintubation uh, for patients who were status post CT surgery as well. And again, as we talked about before, highest mortality benefit in patients who had an underlying history of COPD, even if that wasn't the reason that they were intubated, right? So these are patients who are post cardiac surgery. Their COPD has nothing to do with this. But um, just given that history, prophylactic uh, non invasive PPV after extubating patients actually showed some benefit. Um, now, in Patients who were, you're trying to extubate early. So again, not patients who were ready to get extubated and you extubated them either with or without signs that they're failing. 
This is, this is patients who you're really trying to get them off the ventilator quickly to try to minimize your evaporates, right? So you put them on an IPBV to try to get them extubated when they're not really showing you signs that they're ready yet. Not surprisingly, um, it did not really have the desired effect that they wanted when, they, when this was looked at. So um, NIPPV may also, so it may work in uh, non-COPD or acute cardiac pulmonary edema, but there was more failure rates and higher mortality in those patients. So this was a registry study um, that looked at 11 million inpatients and um, the failure rate of NIPPV amongst non-COPD versus COPD. So the non-COPD patients were higher again, just the, the same trend that I was talking about, better in patients with COPD. Um, and the interesting thing though, is that those who received mechanical ventilation and failed NIPPV had a higher mortality. So in other words, if your patient has COPD, go for it. If your patient doesn't have COPD and you're trying to um, prevent it, be a little more cautious and take the signs that they may not be doing well, instead of going cranking up on your settings as we discussed before, probably best to just intubate them early. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the newer devices. Um, so high flow nasal cannula. So this is one of the more hot topic ones. So this is, so this is the VapoTherm device. Um, this is the OptiFlow device and this is the Comfort device. So all, um, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I think this is the Airbow actually. Some of my RT colleagues and some of my uh, techs back there might be able to, to correct me if I'm wrong. So they all do the same thing, though, right? Um, and we'll talk a bit about more about that in a minute. One of the other devices, again, another teaser, is the helmet device. So what does high flow do? So it basically delivers heated air into your uh, through your nose at a higher rate. It's really all it is, as is indicated by the name. So um, regular nasal cannula delivers flow rates up to 15 liters per minute. So some, most of these can actually go up to 60 and some can even go up to 70 liters per minute. So you're talking about a lot of flow um, through that one device. <clears throat> so the effects when this is compared to um, uh, supplemental oxygen is it does many of the same things that we talked about with mask ventilation through NIPPV. So it decreases your work of breathing and, and decreases your respiratory rate. It actually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it improves gas exchange, improves lung volumes, better lung compliance. Um, one of the things it also does though, that's an added advantage to um, mask ventilation is that it decreases your functional dead space. So in other words, the mask, between the mask and the patient's nose, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of air, right? So in that air, you're gonna recirculate a lot of CO2. And not a lot of it is that not a lot of that air that you're pushing is getting, getting pushed down, particularly in patients who are on CPAP. Um, what high flow is doing is delivering much higher rates. So that really isn't, isn't as much of an effect, number one, because the flows are higher. And also because um, you have less of that space between the device and the patient's nose or mouth. So when might you use it? So this is really... Um, I mean, this is sort of my take home point, if you will. This is really the best indication for, um, for high flow in the setting of acute hypoxic respiratory failure. Not necessarily hypercapnic. Some literature to suggest maybe it's not as bad, but certainly the literature is in favor of it being used in the setting of acute hypoxic respiratory failure and possibly even over an IPPV um, through a mask. So, um, this study was actually done in the New Journal a couple of years ago, and here they actually demonstrated that there is, this was in a study of about 300 patients, so they were all randomized, one group was randomized to um, supplemental oxygen with uh, non breather, one was high flow ventilation uh, through high flow nasal cannula, and then the other was through mass ventilation uh, and IPPV, the more traditional way. So um, what they found actually that there, there's a potential benefit with high flow. Um, that may be inversely proportional to the hypoxia severity. So in other words, the more severe the hypoxia, the uh, lower the innovation rate, excuse me. 
excuse me, actually, I, I misspoke. So, uh, so this was, so this group was actually patients who had greater than, uh, a P to F that was greater than 200, and this group had a P to F less than 200. So this is not randomized, they're just breaking these down into subgroups. Um, and the incidence of reintubation, <clears throat> so actually the, the spread, I should say, between incidence of reintubation with high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive positive pressure, pressure, pressure ventilation or, high, or a standard oxygen was larger. Notice that much of that difference actually has to do with the rate of reintubation among those other groups. So high flow stayed the same. Um, so in other words, that suggests that it actually stands the test of time, even in patients who have more severe hypoxia. So the summary here um, with high flow is that it's probably better than, or rather it is better than conventional oxygen therapy in a, in a wide range of settings. Um, so in, in many of them I haven't actually elaborated on, but high flow is also non-inferior to non-invasive ventilation in most settings. Um, and that's, that was actually shown in that prior slide. Has similar effects, better tolerated, possibly even better outcomes in patients who have worse hypoxic respiratory failure than NIPPV through a mask. Um, but more studies need to be done to determine the timing. And actually this was done out of order. So this is actually just showing you um, uh, a meta-analysis that was done looking at high flow nasal cannula compared to control, which is broken down here by conventional oxygen therapy. So clearly a benefit here, and perhaps maybe a benefit with NIPV, with, uh, with high flow compared to NIPBV, again, particularly in patients who are hypoxic and perhaps even patients who are, have more severe hypoxia. So, if you ask the experts, um, they will sort of tell you this. So when should we use NIPPV through a face mask versus high flow? Um, this is actually in Europe, so keep that in mind. Now, again, as I mentioned before, acute hypoxic respiratory failure tends to win. And that's when, it's, when, when most people suggest that it should be used. And maybe in other settings, but probably not over um, uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation by mask. So what about the helmet device? So why is it, why, why has this been thought of? Well, one of the problems with the full face mask, um, the one that you see normally in the ICU, is that many times um, we don't get the seal that we want. And if we don't get the seal that we want, you're actually losing the benefits of the positive pressure. So, you know, with helmet ventilation, because it, if you saw it, it looks like a spacesuit, right? It wraps around your neck. Um, there's a better seal, generally because less problem with hair and, you know, the fact that it's, it's actually going on more than one surface. It's actually circumferential. Um, so it may actually deliver the PEEP better than, uh, than um, non-invasive positive pressure through a mask. Wear. There's better compliance. So believe it or not, people actually feel more comfortable with that spacesuit sitting around their head as opposed to a full mask. Um, now, what about the evidence? So what is the support that we have? Well, it's not very big. Um, there are some very small studies that have come out that show lower hospital mortality, lower intubation rates, lower complications, um, and maybe even a decreased mortality with a helmet compared to the full face masks. And the theory about why this is, is again, because of the, the, the PEEP issue. There was one study that came out a few a couple of years ago in JAMA a very small pilot study of I think about 80 patients that showed a huge mortality difference. Now, again, keep in mind, this is a small study, so it's probably not what might be representative when a larger one comes out. But one of the things that they showed is that when you compare the group um, who got helmet compared to the, the group that got um, BiPAP, uh, the PEEPs were different. So the level of PEEP that use, or the IPAP, I should say, the EPAP, I should say, the EPAP was different it was lower in the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation group by mask uh, compared to the helmet group. So in other words, it confirms, it might confirm the suspicion that we were talking about, about potentially better seal, better comfort, better compliance, so patients are keeping it on longer, and that might be why. But larger studies are really needed to, before it's, it's supported in widespread use. By the way, um, the patient population that this has been most studied in is ours, which is shocking, right? Because the literature on ARDS for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is not that great. Again, it's, it's there, 
Um, and it may be beneficial, but um, not, in, not to the extent that we see in helmet. So um, after all that, your brain might be a little tired of thinking so much. Um, so I'm gonna sort of break this down into you know, sort of take home points here. So what you wanna do, um, and this is probably the most important thing I can say, is plan your, your exit strategy, right? So as we talked about before, certain patient populations, you wanna be very careful about waiting too long um, before you pull the trigger on innovating them, if you put them on NIPPV and they're not doing what you like them to do. So my approach whenever I practice is I want to ensure that the patients, that I have a plan for what I want to do to get them off BiPAP. So, and that's very easy to see in the setting of COPD and also uh, in the setting of heart failure. COPD, you got to give them steroids. We need to wait a little bit. The steroids don't work immediately, but wait and see. Usually those patients do great. Diarese my patients with heart failure. So that's what's going to help to get them off right? In patients, in other patient populations, that's harder to do. So patients who have pneumonia, harder, you know, it's, it's harder to do that. So I tend to be very selective with how I use it there. But the point here is you need to plan your way of getting them out, um, of getting them off BiPAP. And if you put them on it, and it's for one of those patient populations where the data is a little less supportive, but it's still there, um, you want to be very quick to act if you see that they're not improving or they're becoming dependent on your BiPAP. So um, NIPPV is generally first line for patients with COPD and acute pulmonary edema. That's the gold standard. That's where we should definitely be using it. That's where we see the mortality benefit and the decreased risk of innovation. It's probably should be first line for immunosuppressed patients, again, specifically patients who have hematologic malignancies with pneumonia or uh, acute lung injury or ARDS. And again, that's because of how high the mortality is for the patients who do get intubated in that group. Um, it can be used in other selected patients, but again, you should always have a plan B. If it looks like your patient's not doing well, pull the trigger early and just go ahead and int intubate them. So um, the data, again, is conflicting with patients with asthma, but again, my strategy is still the same. Um, I want to see that improvement and act if I don't. High flow nasal cannula, again, has most of the perks of NIPPV, decreased, uh, decreased work of breathing, increased gas exchange, even might be better in terms of decreasing the functional dead space, but it has fewer complications. So by virtue of that, it definitely should be used in patients who have acute hypoxic respiratory failure, probably not in other settings. Helmet ventilation may be a nice alternative strategy to prevent our patients with ARDS and, and bad pneumonia from getting intubated, but we need to still see with better studies. And again, <laughs> I want to reinforce this just to make sure that the point hits home. Plan your threshold for ex escalating your, your uh, ventilatory strategy um, if, it show, if your patient's not, not looking like they're improving. So you might still be mad because I haven't really given you a plan of attack when you see your next patient like that. So um, here's my conceptual framework. So if I have a patient who's an extremis um, or obtunded or has some signs of hemodynamic instability, I'm gonna intubate them, right? So now the, the caveat for the extremis, um, so my background in emergency medicine, I have seen a lot of patients look really bad in two particular settings who turn around relatively quickly. That's patients who have, car who have pulmonary edema as one of their causes. Um, or asthma as one of their causes. <clears throat> so again, very early, perhaps in the emergency department, it might be beneficial. Um, but again, I'm acting very aggressively when I'm in those settings. So I'm giving those patients magnesium sulfate with the scant data that's out there to support it, but some strong evidence in, in emergency medicine literature. I'm also giving them, um, you know, epi and things of that nature. So, um, but if I see that they're not doing well, I don't wait. I act very quickly. So, but beyond those two caveats, in any other setting where you see someone who's an extremis, or especially if they're severely obtunded and it's not from obstructive sleep apnea, and it's not clear that that's the only reason, um, or if they're hemodynamically unstable, I would just go ahead and intubate them. Now, so if they don't, this is where I look at sort of, what are they looking like, right? So. Is this acute hypoxic respiratory failure, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, or both? Now, 
if it's purely acute hypoxic respiratory failure, um, <clears throat> so is it is it really is it getting worse really quickly, right? So in other words, do these patients look like they're developing ARDS? In those settings, um, depending on the circumstance, most of the time I would still head into it. Um, now you wouldn't be wrong for trying an IPPV, but because those patients tend to have a higher risk of failure and patients who fail on IPPV tend to do worse, especially if you wait a while, that's my rationale for actually acting early to intubate those patients. Now, <clears throat> what about, no, so if, there's, if it's not rapidly getting worse, if it's more of a slow progression, this is exactly the setting where I use high phonies, okay? This is where I sort of jump to it almost as a default. So now you've done stuff and you reassessed, right? If, if after an hour, maybe two, um, they look like they're failing, um, I tend to intubate those patients. Now, some people may actually give them an IPPV, but again, I'm not gonna go along with the sinking ship. If they're proving that to me with that, and it has all the benefits, more, most of the benefits that um, an IPPV does, at least with respect to acute hypoxic respiratory failure, um, and they're failing, I'm gonna intubate them. Now, what if the patient has acute hypoxic respiratory failure or both? So this is where it actually gets very complicated. So here's where I ask what the cause is. And this is because, of course, in patients who have acute CO COPD or pulmonary edema as their cause, pulmonary edema can cause acute hypercapnic respiratory failure if the patient has um, respiratory muscle fatigue and therefore they're not taking enough breaths in. Um, that's where the literature is very good for NIPPD, right? So that's where I would use that. Now, you give it to them, but again, I'm doing stuff to try to get them off of it. So after doing those things, I reassess them. If they're failing, then I'm just gonna go ahead and intubate them, same as before. Now, here's where it gets more complicated. So immunocompromised patients with pneumonia, um, I'd, give them, I'd go ahead and, and give them an IPPV again, based on the literature about doing worse with intubation. Um, I might give them a couple time, couple tries. So I do something, or we increase the settings, they're still failing. I increase them again, mm, they might be declaring themselves. So I would go ahead and intubate them if they fail. Now, if they don't fail, then I let them be and try to gradually wean them off if I can. What about asthma? So I actually do try an IPPV in these settings, but again, it's for a very brief period of time. So no more than one reassessment. And if they look like they're not doing well, even after all the things that I've given them, um, or if, you know, I might wait a little while if, they're, if they need some time, but if they're failing, certainly I would go ahead and intubate them. Obstructive sleep apnea, um, if they have any of those high risk features that we talked about, so if they're really hypercapnic, really hypercapnic, um, so their pH is 7.1, right? Just as an example, um, their PCO2 is 115. Um, or if I'm seeing that it's not just obstructive sleep apnea, if their bicarb is low, indicating that they might have something like a metabolic acidosis going on concomitantly, then I would go ahead and intubate those people. If not, I might, I would try them on an IPPV and give, again, these are the patients you want to give a lot of time to, and you want to give a lot more support to than you would in awareness. But if they fail, after you reassess them, have a very low threshold to intubate them if you feel that you've done all you can to try to prevent that. <clears throat> Chest trauma, based on the literature, <laughs> I haven't practiced emergency medicine a little bit, but if I ever do that again and I see those patients, I would certainly try them on an IPPV <clears throat> and reassess them. If they fail, then go ahead and intubate them. You might be noticing a pattern here. <laughs> um, my reassessments are very targeted, and that's sort of my approach to this. Again, to prevent them from failing too long. Patients who have neuromuscular weakness or it's unknown, um, I actually tend to have a very low threshold to intubate those patients. Um, Understanding that doing so, you, you're probably going to end up trachea because they're not going to probably not they're probably going to take a while to get off the ventilator. So, do we have time for yeah. a couple questions? Um, so, I know one of the questions we got from the audience reads: Can you please comment on other modes of ventilation, like PCV? Pressure control ventilation. Okay, so um, that wasn't really the focus of the talk, but uh, it's essentially akin to NIPPV. So um, with many caveats, I'm not gonna go into right now, but um, I'm not sure, maybe a, 
maybe a point of clarity just for the what exactly they might be referring to because that's a big topic <laughs> Question to ask for more clarification. Sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm going to talk about the or my um, We're a little over, but that's okay. okay. All right. Well, we're awaiting clarification. Maybe we can go over the um, C questions. Yeah, sure. Okay. The red? Yeah. The, the oh. arrow. Okay. <laughs> I'll just go bring it down here. All right. So, what patients have the clearest benefit for NIPBV and acute hypoxic respiratory failure? Exactly. C. You guys didn't fall for the C and B trick. <laughs> So, um, what context might be best to use hypo-nasal cannula? B, right? So, only acute hypoxic respiratory failure is the best. So, what factors best predict failure of an IPPV in patients who have acute hypoxic respiratory failure uh, when it's measured the first hour after initiation? This actually goes back to one of the studies that I had. Say it again. B, no. E, right. So how severe your hypoxia is based on the P to F ratio. And also you're, again, not intuitive, but low type, but uh, so actually lower tidal volume, excuse me. I think I might've misspoke earlier when I said higher tidal volumes. Um, it was lower tidal volumes. So what are some of the physiologic effects of NIPPV? <clears throat> yes, so A and C, right? So it, it improves gas exchange and it also decreases preload. So it affects on the heart and affects on the, on the lungs. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a, this is a case, so meant to make you think a little bit. So I'll summarize here, 60 year old man, has history of all the things that you'd expect in someone with heart failure. Um, short of breath for two weeks, came in hypertensive, tachycardic, tachypneic, hypoxic, um, in distress. So the, so you, all, the, all the usual stuff is done by the triage nurse. What will be the best next step to address their, um, their respiratory status? So first off, what do you think they have? What do you think is going on? Significant JVD, crackles throughout the lung fields. Right, so probably has pulmonary edema, especially with the heart failure history and the hypertension history. So um, what would you do? Right, so the answer is C. You'd wanna, you wanna start them on BiPAP. Now, you may not be wrong to start them on high phonies of cannula, but the reason that that might not be the best answer is because they're showing you signs that they're in stress. And that's probably not the best mode of applying positive pressure in someone who is like that, the best one is to probably give them some inspiratory support as well, namely by that. All right, thank you very much. We'd love to thank uh, Dr. Holder for a great, great talk tonight. Um, we thank you all for attending with us tonight and we will see you on August 13th with our next speaker. Have a great night.